The first alert I had that something was going wrong was when I, in 1969, overnight, the two gorgeous men were gone. I, <laughs> they vanished. I'd never gotten to know them very well. Um, I didn't know them well enough to call them up on the phone and say, Where, where'd you go? They, they just vanished. And nobody said anything to me. And all of a sudden I was paired with somebody totally different. Now I knew that a station had canceled in Texas. I, so I thought to myself, I wonder if they're panicking because a station canceled in Texas. Another thing had happened that disturbed me. Uh, um, as, as for the, they paired me, they brought in a new character. And he wasn't gorgeous. He was uh, um, an elderly character actor, a very nice man. And, but uh, he was supposed to be a congressman that spent most of his time in Washington, D.C. And we had some sort of supposed I never knew what it was supposed to be, a friendship or whatever. All I knew was it was about it was so exciting, it would have put an insomniac in a coma. And I was parked on the back burner on the stove with this, what it was it, this nothing burger? I didn't understand what was happening and I wondered if the, the and I remember, and this is 1969, this is a year into the show, I was, brand new to the world of camera because of all the things I've gone into in relation to my other career. I remember as if it were yesterday, I was sitting in this cold, I, the, the director wanted to give me instructions about um, um, some of the, far, the following day's work. I remember that the room was so cold and I, I remember wishing, wishing that I brought a sweater and it's because I was so new to camera, I didn't realize the room is cold because of the machinery. It's just like surgery. Because of the machinery, they want to cold up and I was freezing. But I remember that over in that left corner, the guys were putting together something, uh, closing down the machinery. And I heard the crew talking about the fact that Agnes Nixon was going to open another soap. Uh, and um, she was already working on it and what have you. And so I thought, oh, well, I guess Agnes put us on the back burner because she has something extra to go to, uh, to go through to open this thing and then maybe she'll get around to giving me a real thing. And then I, uh, 1969, toward the end of that, I knew that my, um, my one year thing was about to be up. Was going to be up. It was going to be up in about a month. So what had always astonished me is even though I didn't get on very well with that guy, the, 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 the agent who had called me, and it was really kind of ugly, I thought that when I turned out to be the first black star in the central role in the history of daytime, that he would come uh, ready to make up and uh, uh, ride the rocket to uh, heaven with me. He never got in touch with me. And I spent years trying to figure out that out. I thought, you couldn't have been so nasty on the phone, that he wasn't, this has turned out too well. You, what's, what's going on? That I never heard from him. Well, I don't have to go to him. I don't have to go to him. I know what I'm going to do. Mind you, this is a month away from my contract being up. I knew. I was glad. I thought, oh, that's, hey, wait a minute. This is a, an opportunity. Um, uh, this guy is going to be off my back legally in another month. I'll be able to get rid of him and I can bring in an agent who is a dream. So I got myself all set for when my contract was up. I was going to get in touch with the most brilliant agent in the business, a guy by the name of Stark Hesseldine. Let me tell you about Stark Hesseldine. <laughs> 
I got it, most, most of the agents didn't want to see me because they knew I couldn't get any work on a camera. They, 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 they'd, say to their indoor sec they'd say to their secretaries, get rid of her, she's uncastable, tell her we're not taking anybody anymore. You know, they, they went, this man was decent enough to give me an appointment. <laughs> so anyway, um, Norman and I sat down. This is Stark Hesselty. I'm going to pretend you're me, okay? This is what he said to me. Look, honey. I think you're gorgeous. And I think you're one of the most talented actresses in this town. Brilliant. But there's no market for you. You're not where they're looking, what they're looking for. You can't do anything for me and I can't do anything for you. I can't make any money for you. What's the point? I fell in love with him right away. Because anybody who tells you the truth in this cockeyed business is saving you a lot of trouble. And what Stark Heseltine had just handed me was a coat of armor. Because what he was saying to me, it's got nothing to do with you. It has to do with the business. I'm tired of knocking my head against a concrete wall. So from then on, from that day forward, because he was so brilliant and I had so much respect for him, and he sat down and he did that, he gave me a coat of armor. Never again has a no in my life in this crazy business, ever been internalized as something that was wrong with me. That's what he gave me. Okay, so anyway, he started loosening up <laughs> and talking about what it was like to take, I mean, he had signed Lee Chamberlain. Lee Chamberlain was gorgeous, brilliant, what, how he couldn't get her arrested. He was tired of that and so on. And he, I felt like it's, I felt like it's like, I had to, I was sitting there listening to all these stories. I felt like I was his psychiatrist. And <laughs> at the, it's funny, at the end of the thing, we both had formed some kind of a bond. I respected the hell out of him for all the reasons I just told you. And in his way, I was very aware he was utterly charmed by the grace with which I had swallowed the castor oil. So I went away from Star Castleteen knowing that if I was ever able to come to him with a part already in my hand and say, would you represent me on this? He would have represented me in the New York Minute. So I sat back and I thought, oh, well, I'll wait until it's time. Well, almost a few days later, a month later, before it was time for that to be up. They put a piece of paper in front of me and said, this is uh, non-negotiable. This is what we're prepared to do if you are interested in playing this role for another year. Uh, we will continue it for another year. And if it's not uh, if you're not interested, well, you know, you're welcome to pick up your marbles and go play someplace else. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I had brought them the publicity of the world. When she went out there and said, I'm, uh, I'm creating the first black star, and she had gotten phenomenal publicity. She had gotten, I was in the head of Newsweek in the, my picture and the whole story about that. TV Guide, a huge article. Uh, in that particular TV Guide, there had been uh, two huge articles, one the Sonny and Cher thing on the cover and the one in the back about me, and that was in the day. A three-page article with my picture all over the place and that. A three-page article written by a brilliant guy called Ross Drake that made it so arresting. He was such a marvelous writer. He summed it all up with the title. He said, black, but not black enough. And then the subtitle was, there are few parts for black actresses and even fewer for those who don't look the part. That's Ross Drake. They've got this gorgeous picture of me and he starts from a sentence that the moment you start the sentence, there's enough of a hook that if you did start reading it, you'd read it all the way through. That's how good that article was. Now, this is back in the days when television 
guide, the TV guide, was the only place where you could find out what was on that box. Not the 100,000 pages places you have now, including the roll-ups on the TV. There was only one place. Every single, that meant that every single uh, family in the country that had a television set, the TV guy was sitting right next to the television set. That meant that every single family in this country that had a television set read that article about me. I knew that Agnes Nixon had written a so-called One Life to Live. Um, and then Cy Peck, thrilled with the tsunami of letters that he had gotten for uh, How Black Do You Have to Be, gave me a whole page in the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times, a whole page in the Arts and Leisure section, with a great big four-column blow-ups of my face and my face with Peter, and let me write the whole article. She'd gotten all this out of me, and she's giving me a, a, a 20, not she, I shouldn't say she, because I didn't know at the, that point that Agnes had anything to do with it. That was the problem. Uh, to, to, they're giving me a $25 annual raise. After that, behind that kind of, at, I couldn't believe what was happening. And so I didn't sign. I just didn't sign because I knew something was going terribly wrong. And uh, Doris Quinlan, who was the producer, said to me, what I thought was, when I saw the credits and they said, it said Creative Horizons at the end of the show, I thought that was a subsidiary of ABC. And the studio, which is the only place where the actors saw, because we were way uptown in, uh, in the studio, and the uh, Power was in the tower downtown in the AB, the great big skyscraper with ABC up on the top floors. I thought a whole bunch of white guys sitting around a conference table up there in the tower were the ones who were figuring out all these lousy contracts I was getting. I had no idea it was coming from some different place. So I, that, I, I still thought that's who, where this, this funny contract was coming from. So Doris Quinlan said to me, she said, after a couple of days, she said, you do understand, don't you? This is non-negotiable. I said, yes, yes, I understand. And in retrospect, I think she was getting anxious because the powers that be, wherever they were, were sitting on her and saying, when are you going to get her to sign, for goodness sake, said so-and-so. So she was having to add, so she stopped speaking to me. She did, she just froze me out. She wouldn't even talk to me. And I panicked. And I signed. I cut my throat. Because once they get away with that, that's the protocol for the rest of your life. On any renewal, I would be given the choice. This is what we're going to pay you. If you're happy with it, fine. If you aren't, feel free to take a walk. That was a protocol for the rest of the time, so there was never any representation from anybody. And I thought I, I didn't know what was what or who was who or what was going on. I just knew that things were happening that I didn't understand. And uh, that was 1969 and that nothing burger. 1970, she got Agnes Deacon opened all my children. Both shows were a half an hour. She put them together with all my children first so that all my children was able to. One of the things that I did not know, I would not find out because nobody was telling me what the hell was going on. What I did not know is a third of the audience that was watching that show was black. A third of the audience. If I'd had an agent, I would have known it. They had the internal breakdowns. Nobody. I, there was nobody to tell me anything. That's one thing that I hope that any young person going into this business will, will recognize. Information is everything. You have got to have the data. You have got to have the information. I had no information. So I thought, oh my God, well, maybe 
It was uh, the, the, the fact that the station canceled in Texas and they panicked. What happened? I didn't know what happened, but I went along with the program. I had no idea a third of it. Okay, she pairs these things together like Siamese twins so that all my children can feed off of this one, or One Life. Everybody who was looking at the call a storyline as a virtual block, when Agnes Nixon put a huge black storyline in All My Children with John Donnell starring, she inherited the entire block of black voters and overnight, all my children picked up the same kind of percentages and said, literally like that. So people started looking at them as if they were joined Siamese twins. And it was a success overnight also.